Blue suit, blue suit, red tie, red tie, blue suit, red tie. Good morning. There are some days in the House of Commons in Ottawa when it's better to be leader of the opposition than to be prime minister, because you can sit there and you can excoriate the government for the latest boo-boos. And God knows the Tory government is a classic uh, master at giving the opposition fodder, fuel, and a good laugh for the general public if they don't take their politics too seriously. Here this morning is John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party, and he was counting up before the programme how many apologies the Tories have had to make recently, and he lost count. The latest one will come up, perhaps, in the House of Commons today, the MP for Quadra. And then we're going to go to Brian Williams, the chairman, with his report on the Wilderness Advisory Committee, Lyle Island. And on the face of it, as I said last September 11, 1985, the committee appears to say, log... Lyle Island, Brian Williams. And we shall be questioning Mr. Williams on his recommendations of he and his massive committee covering 16 huge areas in British Columbia, uh, a report done virtually overnight on the program. But, and then today, do you remember the funny old guy that used to live in the top of the Bay Shore? The recluse, the guy with the long fingernails? I've got a fellow here today called Drosnin who has done the definitive book on the repulsive personal habits of Citizen Hughes. He has some of what he'll tell us on the program about Hughes's habits. To the richest man in the world in a blacked out hotel room, buck naked, with his hair halfway down his back, his beard down to his belly button, his fingernails three, four inches long and grotesque yellowed corkscrews, uh, shooting up massive doses of codeine, a billionaire junkie. Um, lying on a bed whose sheets were changed seasonally, I mean three or four times a year, in a room that was never once cleaned. Um, the richest man in the world, surrounded by filth and debris, unwashed, unbathed, uh, living like a derelict. But dealing on an even-up basis with money under the table for some of the top politicians in the United States. But first, John Turner, leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition in the House of Commons, after the break. John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party, hopes to be Prime Minister after the very next election, don't you, sir? That's, uh, that's the plan, Jack. But let's divert you to British Columbia, first of all. Are you prepared to tell me that the full weight and finances of the Liberal Party nationally will be used to campaign in the next provincial election for the Liberals under Art Lee? That's a commitment. And uh, just as we are doing in Manitoba, in the provincial election in Manitoba, with federal members of Parliament helping, we expect to give Art Lee a lot of support here, depending on where he wants us, how he wants us, when he wants us. Including money? Including whatever financial support we can muster, yeah. Good. Well, that's almost enthusiastic. Not quite totally. Well, it's early in the morning, and we'll get on into this program as but we go. But surely, you, surely you, you must dislike the policies of Bennett as much as you dislike the policies of Moroni. I try to, uh, I try to stay within my own, my own jurisdiction. But except for education. Except for education, where I'm absolutely... Uh, outraged, as I believe most British Columbians are, at the failure of the province to make education the focus of the future. Right now. You had a nice, quiet, peaceful, well-ordered well convention in Vancouver this weekend. It was peaceful, but it was open. It but was, what a it, difference it, from Quebec last weekend. Well, uh, Quebec, uh, we, had, we faced a very sad moment in Quebec. We does, that, does that mean a split in the party and that if an election were called tomorrow, you might not recover enough to win any appreciable seats because of Chrétien's defection. I think everybody, not only in Quebec, but right across the country, was upset about Jean Chrétien's departure. We can't lose a man like Jean without being weaker for it. But the party in Quebec, uh, we talked and thrashed the question out over the weekend, came out on the Sunday morning, unified, buoyant, upbeat, and... Uh, I think, ready to rebuild in Quebec as we are elsewhere. Rebuild, because you've been pretty badly scarred in that one. Well, we were scarred right across the country in the last general election, and, uh, but uh, we're... Part of the rebirth. 
Part of the rebirth, Jack. People, ideas. How many apologies did you get from Tories and our Prime Ministers in the House of Commons last week? We got about three. And uh, there seems to be a new style of the Mulroney government if you apologize early enough. Because they were a little, I think, upset about allowing the Nielsen affair on the eavesdropping to go on over a weekend. So now the technique is to apologize right away. Well, this is a new style of government. Apologize, and you hope people forget about it. It's, 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 it's as if uh, we got picked up on a, on a driving charge or a speeding charge, and uh, we said to the policeman, hey, I'm sorry I did it. Don't give me a ticket. Well, Mr. Mulroney and his ministers are saying sorry. Forget about it. Don't give us a ticket. As in the case of Andre Champagne. Now, there's <laughs> grist for your mill, isn't it? Isn't this a woman who gets 90-odd thousand a year as a cabinet minister, but has no staff and has virtually no office? Well, Andre Champagne is presumably the, the minister of youth. We've got, uh, we've got a very deep crisis in young people in this country. We've got 700,000 out of work. And we are supposed to have a youth minister. But the prime minister, uh, instead of uh, firing her, uh, gave us a new technique, Jack. Uh, what you do is you just uh, cut her budget to zero. You take away all her office staff. Uh, you don't leave her in office. All she's left is uh, the limousine and the chauffeur. But she's got no program, no money. And uh, the young people of the country really wonder what's happened. And uh, I called her in, in Ottawa, I called her the Le Ministre Fantôme, the ghost minister. The minister in the shadows, the minister up there in the air. And her offense was the one in the House of Commons that brought the quick apology on the second day? Well, yeah, the, 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 her second apology, but she was accosted by an NDP member with, uh, with, with a letter, uh, which she had written, apparently, uh, across the country, saying that the prime purpose of her Department of Youth before the election was to recruit young progressive conservatives. That is to say, use our money, the taxpayers' money, to recruit uh, young conservatives. Now, first of all, she looked at the signatures. She said, well, it looks like my signature, but it may be a forgery. I'm going to have to check it out. So we got, we got a minister who doesn't recognize her signature, who doesn't recognize letters she signed. Uh, so uh, total confusion, total anarchy. Should she resign? Well, I don't think she has to resign. There's nothing left. She doesn't have a department. How long will she have a 90000 a year for no department? It's up to the prime minister. The latest one was in the Sunday Star, which says that Tory members have been ordered to hire as census commissioners, even though they failed miserably on tests given to census candidates. And if you're a Tory, you get in with 20% of the test, where a passing rate is 60%. Now, are you going to spend a lot of the time in the House of Commons making foolish out of them again on this kind of thing? Well, I think our members later this afternoon will have something to say about that, Jack. But how it works is that if you and I want to apply as a census commissioner here in British Columbia, we've got to pass a test. We've got to show that we understand the geography of the province. We've got to understand the, the political system, how our democracy works, both in Victoria and Ottawa. And we write a little exam. Now, I figure that you and I would perhaps end up in the 80s there, I hope so, but uh, there's a passing grade, 60. Now, uh, they've been hiring census commissioners in Ontario and Quebec who've been getting 10, 11, 20 percent. Uh, they can't pass it, they can't make the grade, but they're hired anyway, you know. Mind you, that's always been a kind of little piece of political port uh, payola that the party in power has always done. You hire out your own people as census commissioners. Well, all things being equal, I suppose you try to look for people who are friendly, but uh, at least our people pass the test. And, and at the same time, I'm quite sure under many uh, eras of liberal public works regimes, you did something like this fellow MP did in the House of Commons, wrote a letter saying he wants a billion dollars worth of contracts of less than 30,000 given to people who give money to Moroni's funds, right? I, uh, right, I can't... Uh, did I, the Liberals do that kind of thing? Uh, not so far as I know, and I've never... Uh, it's been a long time since we had a public work scandal. The, the classic one, of course, the, was the Boharnois Dam years ago under Mackenzie King. But here's a member of parliament blatantly going out and uh, writing his constituents saying, give us some good Tory names for public works contracts and uh, we won't even have a bid. Have you had an apology for that one? Yes, uh, not from Mr. Tremblay. He hasn't showed up in the House of Commons uh, since the uh, letter was discovered. Mr. Nielsen, the deputy prime minister, said that the minister had, uh, the member had made a mistake. He apologized and he, he, Mr. Nielsen, was sure that the opposition would accept the apology. And will you? Well... Uh, an apology is an apology. The letter was written. It's symptomatic of a growing corruption, I believe, in government ranks. And you, of course, accepted Nielsen's own apology on his admission that he'd been party to listening to bugging of your meetings. 
Yes, we accepted Eric Nielsen's apology. Uh, it, uh, but uh, the question we put on the same day to the Prime Minister was this, Jack. Here is a man who is Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. He's the number two person in the government. He admitted eavesdropping, spying on a regular basis. Uh, when he did it, it was only unethical and unprofessional. Today, if he did it, it would be a crime under the criminal code. So we asked the Prime Minister, do you want someone who admitted to doing that on a repeated basis as your number two person in your government? And the Prime Minister said, yes, of course, I want Mr. Nielsen. Do you think any of this mars the government, or do people look on it as kind of uh, automatic fodder between the likes of thee and me and well, newspaper reporters I, uh, and frankly, media reporters? Frankly, I don't like getting into it in personal terms because I think it just adds to public cynicism. People say, well... We've got to do it. We've got to do it. Part of our job, in fact, uh, Winston Churchill said our prime job as the opposition is to oppose and expose, and we're bound to do it. But it's a little sorry to, to have to bring up these issues uh, day after day. It heightens public cynicism in our public figures. Oh. And of course, I guess Mr. Mulroney deserves it a bit because he made patronage a big issue in the last election. A you had issue. an option, Mr. Turner. I had an option, yeah. Boy, oh boy. <clears throat> More important issues, perhaps, with John Turner and your calls, too, after the break. Would it be fair, Mr. Turner, to ask you to comment on the Wilderness Advisory Committee? Because uh, I excoriated you myself for your attitude the last time, and you know the basic content of the report, although you haven't read it. Well, I just got this report this morning from, from Brian, from Brian Williams, who's going to be on your, on your program later this morning, and it's a, it's a good piece of work. My position, because I'm going to state my position, because I'm sure I know you're going to state yours. Uh, my position has been that uh, the South Moresby ought to be a national or a provincial park. That the rights, whatever they are, of the Haida people ought to be respected, and that there ought to be some accommodation for logging uh, on a designated basis. Now, uh, Mr. Williams' report uh, just handed it to me. Uh, I think he wants to designate the South Moresby as a national or a provincial park. I think he calls it a national park. I'm, I'm delighted. Lyle Island is the area, of course, that has been the disputed uh, part, of the, uh, part of the whole subject. And what Mr. Williams says, allow logging to continue on certain parts of Lyle Island, but protect the Darwin Sound side up to the, to the headland and protect Windy Bay, which is the, one of the great primeval forests of the world. I would have liked Lyle Island to have been wholly protected, but I can understand Mr. Williams's argument that it's already been scarred and logged very badly. And at least he is protecting the environmentally precious Darwin side, uh, Darwin Sound side of the island, and and Windy Bay. I it think means I th now too that Sandspit will not instantly become a ghost town, which is somewhat important. Well, uh, you know, I mean, we're desperate for jobs in British Columbia. We're in a worse state than we've been in 50 years. The province of British Columbia, next to Newfoundland, has got the worst unemployment in the country. And uh, I understand the job problem uh, clearly, and I think Mr. Williams has found some basis of accommodation here. Now, mind you, of all the people who went up to the island, I mean, uh, some of the British Columbia ministers went up for a day, and, and uh, Crombie went up for less than a day, and uh, the former Minister of Fisheries, uh, John Fraser, was up for less than a day. I was there for six days. At 1,300 bucks a week. Well, I was there with the Darwin Sound because Jill and I and Bill Reed and Moira Johnson and other, others of us who were concerned about the environmental part of this, uh, of this country because this is a treasure for British Columbia, Jack. Oh, most of it should and, be kept uh, And you and Jack Monroe went up there just after I left. Providing we don't bankrupt half the forest companies operating on TFL 24, 25, and 6. Well, I tell you, I think... And I mean, uh, as a former director of Macmillan Rodell, <laughs> you yourself, of course, are partly responsible for much of what is now regarded as Jack, rapacious logging in the past in Jack, British Columbia. Jack, I've been very careful about where I've criticized criticized the forestry industry. Macmillan Bloedel has no licenses down in the South Moresby. Not in the South. All right, so uh, we're, we're talking now about uh, a treasure for British Columbia, for Canadians, and I think Mr. Williams's report is a good starting point, and I hope the province of British Columbia accepts his recommendation for a national park. One question of vital interest to all British Columbians. What would you do if you were, is there anything you could do better than the Tories? 
for the incredible youth unemployment, the 700,000 in the lost generation, and all those who are going to run out of UIC within a few months. Is there anything that any government can do at once? Would you go the public works route? Jack, uh, you've stated the problem very well. We've got a crisis among our young people. We can lose a half or even a whole generation of Canadians. We, yeah. can, we can turn them off. There are 700,000 young people between the ages of 15 and 24 out of a job. What do we do? Our education has got to be better, got to be more focused. It's got to be more relevant. Our training for young people has to be better. We proposed a national apprenticeship program based on the West German and, and, uh, and Swedish and British models conjunction with the provinces, business and the labor unions, to train our young people on the job, to give them some experience. We proposed a national young entrepreneurs program to encourage young people to set up businesses. We encouraged investment incentives for small business because small business in this country, 25 employees or less, are the biggest employer prospectively for young people. I tell you, uh, any government in Ottawa or in Victoria that doesn't make Getting our young people to work a priority is doing a great disservice to Canada and the province. Is there anything in the budget that does any good for young people? Jack, there wasn't one single word in Mr. Wilson's budget speech on youth or young people. For that matter, there wasn't one single word on forestry or one single word on mining. That's what Mr. Wilson from Toronto thinks of British Columbia. Mind you, it's a, it's a Tory budget, even albeit a fairly modest Tory budget. Did you not expect them to slash unemployment insurance terms and qualifications? Well, our quarrel with the budget is not that they want to focus on the public debt of this country, but that they're doing it in an unfair way. And I'll give you just one figure, you and your viewers. If you earn $15,000 a year in this country, your total cumulative tax increase in the next four years will be 23%. If you earn $200,000 a year, your total tax increase will be 1%. $15,000, 23%, $100,000, 1% increase. That's would, not fair. Would you correct it? I sure as hell would. Questions to John Turner after the break. To the MP for Quadra. Go ahead. Oh, you're speaking today at uh, Tupper. Charles Tupper, just after I leave your program this morning. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Turner. Good morning. Um, I'm, got, I'm a little bit fearful of what might happen if the provincial uh, liberals become more uh, popular enough to sort of incur a split vote uh, in the next election, and we might have to put up with those grotesque soccer heads again. I'm just wondering uh, uh, your opinion on uh, what might arise. What is your feelings on that? He's asking about a possible emergence of a third party and what would happen to British Columbia. You'll dodge that question. No, John. I don't dodge any questions, Jack. Uh, I would say that uh, there's a great growing opinion in the province of British Columbia looking for a moderate, progressive uh, center voice. I think a lot of British Columbians are are tired of the ideological warfare between the social credit on the right and the NDP on the left and are looking for a more moderate approach. And I will back that approach, and that means backing Hartley and the provincial liberals. Forthright statement. My apologies to you. Go ahead, please. Mr. Turner, I'm a little disappointed with the way the opposition performs. Uh, I think Canadians are tired of uh, you beating to death things like 25-year-old bugging scandals and uh, the tuna affair, which was a serious matter but just didn't go away. I think we'd rather have an opposition that deals with uh, more serious economic uh, problems. Well, we, uh, we try to be as constructive as we can about the major issues of the day, like the, the budget and the economic policy of the government. But we have a duty not only to oppose in a constructive way, we have the duty to expose and to hold a government to account. We didn't, uh, we didn't start the tuna affair. We didn't uh, provoke the uh, revelation of Eric Nielsen and the, and the eavesdropping. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, hire census commissioners uh, who could only pass uh, up to 9 to 10 percent on an exam that required 60. I think the people of Canada want us and the New, De New Democratic Party, for that matter, to hold the government to account. That is our duty under our system. My we point, sir, is that uh, you, uh, while you uh, do have a duty to expose them, I agree, 
Uh, you tend to beat them to death, uh, tie up the House of Commons instead of getting on with things that really matter to Canadians, like uh, dealing with the debt left by the Liberals. Well, I tell you, one of the, uh, one of the problems is that uh, most of the attention focused uh, by the media on Parliament is during question period. That is the three quarters of an hour in every session where the government, the Prime Minister, are held to account questions and answers. What, uh, what happens the rest of the day in Parliament is not as closely reported. Well, no. I think that's a very valid point, John, because the media concentrates on that 45 minutes. Yeah, and that's, that's the time we have to oppose. That's the time we have to hold the government to and account. And the rest of your work is seldom seen except by the handful of people who watch the continuous coverage on cable. Well, that's right. We've, uh, I think the opposition uh, has made some very constructive uh, suggestions in the general debate of Parliament. You don't see it. That's the problem. On the telephone now is Frank Bebbin of Bebbin Logging, and I want you to keep this short and sharp to Mr. Tudnick because he hadn't read the report yet, but you might be able to give him some advice on how to read it. Yeah, good morning, Jack. Um, there's just a couple of comments I'd like to make on what Mr. Turner said. He said that McMillan Bodell um, does not have any uh, licenses in the South Moresby. Well, as a director, he should have known that his company owned two licenses on Lyle Island alone. That's the first point I'd like to make clear. In the past. In the past. Yes, they still own them today. That's not my advice, apparently. Oh, well, there we are. That's Frank well, Bevin of Bevin well, Logging. Well, Frank, uh, you're closer to it than I am, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. They're very small, I understand. However, that's uh, not, not that small. There's a fair amount of wood on them. But the, the second point I'd like to make, uh, John McLaughlin, our manager in the Queen Charlotte, and myself talked with Mr. Turner when he was on his tour of the Charlotte for half an hour. He stated that South Moresby was indeed a beautiful area. But there was definitely room for all of us, in his opinion, to be there. Us to log and people to enjoy the recreation. I'm disappointed. As soon as he left us, he's changed his tune. Thank Fr you, Jack. Frank, that's, that's not so. That right? is absolutely so. I, I told you and the committee of people who wanted to preserve jobs on the island that I thought logging to be, could be accommodated. I still think it can. And uh, maybe Mr. Williams' uh, uh, report uh, on Lyle Island will give you the basis of that accommodation. And there's lots of room on the other part of the Queen Charlotte's, north of the South Bone Moresby, to do what you have to do to preserve jobs. Frank, keep listening. Maybe call me again. I'll see if I can get you on with Brian Williams. Yeah, well, what Mr. Turner told me and what he's saying now are in two entirely different things, Jack. Thank you. That is not so, Frank. Well, there we have a dichotomy, I believe you call it. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Jack. Good morning. Mr. Turner, I've heard your political rhetoric against the budget, but would you have the political will to cut the deficit if you were in power, or do you think it's a problem at all? I think it's a big problem. I think the public debt is a very serious problem, and I was the only leader of any political party in the last election to address it. My quarrel with the budget is, is that the burden of controlling the public debt is not being shared equally among all income groups and all regions of the country. Yes, we have a problem. But we can only get out the deficit if we can convince Canadians that the burden of controlling it is being shared fairly. Mind you, this social safety net we have is so good that it might even be endangered. Well, the Minister of Finance has said in his budget that he's going to look at the social programs next time. We'll watch that very carefully. Go ahead from Victoria. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Um, I, I, the point I want to make maybe has been raised a thousand times, but it, to my mind it's never been satisfactorily answered. I think what the people of this country, and in most countries, but this country particularly, would like to see in our government is some accountability. And let me just explain what I mean by that. I don't know any other job, any other vocation in this country, where you can get an elected four-year guaranteed income, high income as a matter of fact, and not have to answer to anybody. Now, if you, Mr. Turner, would like to have the people of this country vote for you, maybe what you'd like to do is to introduce some sort of a guarantee that if we elect somebody to go to Parliament, no matter where, provincial or, or federal, that uh, if he's not doing, or he or she aren't doing their job, we can call them back and ask them why they're not, and have them explain why they're not to their constituents, not in some far off bloody location like Ottawa, where they mutter something into a TV camera and that's supposed to be an answer. I think we have to have, as a matter of fact, I demand as a citizen that we have some sort of accountability from you people, and we're not getting it. Do you mean a recall petition? Oh, yes, that'd just be beautiful. <laughs> well, I don't Guarantee it. I don't believe in the, in the recall under our, our parliamentary system, but I do uh, agree with you on the accountability side of being a member of parliament. And I believe that I'm the, among the few members of parliament who hold regular town hall meetings 
in Vancouver Quadra. As a matter of fact, we're having one on April 3rd. Uh, in Vancouver Quadra, I meet my electors, not just Liberals. It's open to, to everybody in Vancouver Quadra, and indeed anybody in the city of Vancouver. We begin those meetings at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock. They're, they're held twice a year. We get about 800, 900, 1,000 people there, and I stay until every question has been put to me and every question answered. Mr. Turner, I, I'm sure you do. I would just like to, I'd like to reiterate, I don't want to elect somebody or help to elect somebody to go away to, to Victoria or to Ottawa or anywhere else and then just and then I just forget about him for four years because I haven't got a damn thing to do about it. And I, don't, I think that's wrong. Okay, well, I got it. The go. intent and philosophy of government is, is, uh, is, in, that, in that regard is totally misdirected. Okay, because the, the other side of the coin is that with the House of Commons or a legislature, we're supposed to participate in it and cover it and see it and understand it. That's the accountability. Well, but our, it doesn't seem to work under our system of communication. Well, our system is that we elect the best men and women we can find from all the 282 constituencies of Canada, and we elect them to Parliament, or in a different forum, we elect them to the legislature in Vic Victoria. We expect them to exercise their best yeah, judgment on our behalf. Now, the gentleman had a darn good point. I think members of Parliament ought to report on a more regular basis publicly to their constituents. More calls to John Turner after the break. John Turner, leader of the Liberal Party. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, Jack, I wonder if you'll ask your guest uh, what happened to the Liberal wing of the Tuesday to Thursday Club when they got their caught with their pants down on Friday. <laughs> They, uh, oh, yes. The, the background <laughs> being that they could have uh, called a vote and perhaps defeated the government, but nobody was there. Well, as a matter of fact, the, the budget is traditionally tested in two amendments, and, and it was. The NDP put forward an amendment early last week, and uh, we supported that amendment. It was defeated by the overwhelming majority of the government. We put our amendment on Wednesday after I'd made a speech uh, an hour long in the House of Commons setting forth our position. And then traditionally, of course, the final vote on the, the budget is usually just a, a voice vote. Uh, apparently, there weren't uh, uh, enough uh, members in the House to prevent a quick vote being called. Uh, I, uh, I think the House had been tested. The confidence uh, had been gained by the government twice. And uh, there you are. We, uh, we lost uh, uh, a day's debate on the budget, which uh, I believe we'll have to pick up on one of the budget bills. In other words, the Tuesday to Thursday Club won the day. Well, most members are there five days a week. But we, uh, we had some of our members. Uh, in, uh, and on the Friday afternoon, Jack, there has been a generally accommodated understanding that no votes are called on Friday. And there hasn't been a vote called on Friday for a number of years. Just a little embarrassed. A little cute. A little cute. One other small question, if I may. Yep. Uh, uh, this Lily White uh, Liberal Party have seemed to have forgotten the, the forgers they had on the cabinet uh, when they were in power. Well, you're talking about um, you're talking about Francis Fox, and Francis Fox uh, committed an act uh, which he shouldn't have. He resigned as a member of the the cabinet. He went back to his electors in his own writing, put his fate in their hands, and got reelected. Now that's how we should do it under our system. He resigned. He didn't try to talk his way out of it. He didn't make any apology to the House and hope it'd go away. He resigned his, 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 his job. He went back to his own people. He put his case before them. They had re-elected him. That's how we do it in a free society. I'm not uh, saying that what he did was, was right, but he faced the music. Uh, and wasn't he involved in the tussle with Chrétien? Didn't you nominate? Didn't you say, no, I don't want Francis Fox? No, Francis. Uh, Francis's candidacy, I think, was being perceived as a turner Kretschia uh, fight. It wasn't, because Francis supported me during the leadership. Uh, anyway, that's all been worked out, and we're going to use Francis Fox in the future. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning, Mr. Webster. Good morning, Mr. Turner. Good morning. Um, just two questions. I'd like to know what you're doing about the forgotten generation, the people between the ages of 40 and 65 have a terrible time finding jobs and you seem to be doing a lot for the younger people. What are you doing for people of our age to help us find employment? Well, you, you've got a point. Uh, there's no doubt about it that we are disturbed about the younger people. And of course, in last May's budget, we worked very hard to protect our older pensioners. But I've said in the budget, and I said it in the House of Commons last week, and then in Vancouver this weekend, that the people who are taking it 
on the chin as a result of the two budgets of Mr. Wilson and Mr. Mulroney, the May budget, the February budget, are people between, I put it, 35 and 55, but your age uh, bracket is, is, is relevant, and people between $15,000 a year and $40,000 a year. The average Canadian family, in terms of cash flow and income availability and training and retraining, has got a very, very tough problem in this country. And uh, I'll be saying more about it, but your point is an excellent one. Is not one of the real dangerous factors in this country now that we have mass unemployment in the West and 6% unemployment in Toronto? Now, we're jealous. I mean, really, if I were a young guy today, this is tre treason. I'd go to Toronto. Can I ask one more question? Just a minute, I want to get the end of that one. Well, you, am well, I being well, treasonous well, well, Jack, treat? Jack, when the Prime Minister cites all these numbers about how well his government has done on new jobs, what he's forgetting is that a good many of these new jobs are part-time, and what he's really forgetting is that on the fringes of the country, and by the fringes I mean the geographical fringes, British Columbia on the west coast, the Atlantic provinces, Newfoundland, uh, uh, Newfoundland particularly, but the other Atlantic provinces are suffering crippling unemployment. So th those figures are misleading. They mean that whatever recovery we're having from the recession is primarily in central Canada. When he tells us 585,000 jobs found, we don't believe it. Well, uh, we have questioned those figures in terms of their, their, their accuracy. Good many of them are part-time. There are more and more people who've been out of work for more than a year and don't qualify for unemployment insurance. So those figures do not give the whole story. Your final question? Yes, I would like to know, when you go to file or fill in an employment form, is it illegal for them to ask you your age? Depends uh, for whom you're applying. Well, I've been told that they cannot ask you your age until they hire you and that they can ask you your age. And I'm just wondering, I'm hearing two different stories and I don't know, so I'll hang up and listen to the answer. Well, I don't have the answer. I can give you the answer on that one. In certain areas, the federal government, human rights standards, you can't ask about marital status, children, anything but obvious defects. But in private enterprise jobs, you can still ask anything. Yeah, I would think that, uh, that age w would be relevant, um, except that... Uh, uh, as a result of the Charter of uh, Rights and Freedoms, mandatory retirement at 65 is probably not constitutional now, and I think the federal government has had to recognize that. Is that a disaster? <laughs> is that not another thing, said Webster from the West Coast, where you're going to deny younger people the upward mobility and you've got uh, reasonably well-paid civil servants on indexed pensions who are going to hang on? Well, Jack, uh, obviously it's got to be handled flexibly. Uh, but what it recognizes, and the reason, of course, it's in the Charter, some people at your age are better than some people at my age. Oh, no, and, no. Uh, you know, so, it's so that uh, you, you, look at, you look at how a person, a man and woman, is at the age 60, 65. But it's a serious point, though, isn't it? If someone's got a reasonable pension in a government job, they should go at 65, John, and make room for those below. Well, uh, we... But uh, obviously that can't be tolerated by this damn charter. Well, the charter says no discrimination on the, on the basis of age, and a mandatory retirement probably offends that. Yep. Go ahead from Salzburg. Oh, yes, good morning. I was wondering if uh, you think that as the opposition leader that it's sufficient to say that your job is to oppose everything that comes out of the PM's office and that if a little cooperation shouldn't be used, you know? I think you could see more cooperation sometimes in the schoolyard and that the average person seems to... Mm would think that it's essentially the same circus, it's just different clowns in every time. Well, we do. Uh, when something is good, we do pass it very quickly. If something can be improved, we suggest amendments, put them to the House, and we await the verdict of the House. And uh, so I don't, uh, I don't uh, differ with what, we, what you're saying. Uh, but our duty is to some, add some balance to the system. Mm. Our, our duty is to hold, uh, hold matters to account, and uh, well, we, uh, we have the most open, free government in the world. When the government brings something with which we agree, we pass that divorce bill, for instance, very quickly. I'm quite embarrassed when I watch on the, the, new, the news about the uh, debates that go on the House of Commons. You know, I think the children could probably settle arguments more trying to drown each other Well, out. you're talking particularly about question period, period, but I think you'd be pleasantly surprised if you sat in on some of the other debates of the House. But the other point perhaps we should make, Mr. Turner, is the question period is the beauty of the British parliamentary, Canadian parliamentary system, in that ministers are accountable then and there to any question that comes to them without written notice. Jack, we have the freest, most responsive system in the world. We can put questions to the Prime Minister and to ministers without having them in writing, without having them screened, without having them selected. Uh, we're far freer than Westminster. I think we're freer than the American Congress because the President of the United States doesn't have to appear before the House of Representatives or the Senate on a regular basis. They had have had our system. 
President Nixon wouldn't have survived Watergate for more than two weeks. The Vietnam War wouldn't have lasted as long because if they had to appear on a daily basis, take the heat, open it up, I think they wouldn't have survived. My thanks to John Tunner, leader of the Liberal Party, speaking at high school. T Tupper, what? Tupper. What? Charles Tupper, 11 o'clock. My thanks. Next, Brian Williams, the Wilderness Advisory Committee. After the break. You don't kid yourself that uh, when you cut down the 100 acres, 100 hectares you see behind me, that you can make it, as I said, like Stanley Park. The Wilderness Advisory Committee was set up just last winter, and Brian Williams and his colleagues on the committee had, let's face it, a very tough job. Did you manage to bring in recommendations on all 16 of the wilderness areas? Yes, we did, but two of them are that there, wasn't, there was not enough information to make a final recommendation, so we said further study. Otherwise, we did. Without showing any of my own particular bias or predilections, you give me your sum up on what you have recommended for the hot spot at the moment South Mosby. Well, I guess it can best be summed up by saying that uh, we would preserve uh, South Moresby temporarily until such time as there's a chance to have the uh, provincial government negotiate with the federal government to make a national park. Now, when I say South Moresby, uh, we would log Lyle Island except for the Darwin Sound corridor and Windy Bay, what's called Option B which means that we leave a large area for logging. And after all, Jack, it's already been, be, is being logged, and it's come over the top down into Darwin, down into Juan Perez. Let's see the map right now, if I may. We have a fairly good map there. It's a little bit dark in my monitor. Green is the south, green and black are the South Mosby areas. And the entire green area, would, would it, Mr. Williams, be preserved as a park? Yes. And there we have Lyle Island up in the top right-hand corner, which has been logged on and off for 40 or 50 years, correct? That's correct. So therefore, it's log Lyle Island, and even from here we can see the Windy Bay Ecological Reserve and another leaf strip covering... Darwin Sound. Darwin Sound. So that from the water side and at uh, Darwin Sound, you would not be able to see the scars of the logging. That's correct. So how much logging, uh, are you told, would take place? How many years of logging would there be for the contractors on that in TFL 24? Well, Frank Bevan could probably correct me if he calls in, but it, I think it's something in the order of 20 years. I think he said 25 years, but without the Darwin's down strip, and I'm not sure how much that takes away. But 20 to 25 years worth of logging uh, under the present TFL uh, and the present uh, allowable annual cut. Now, you just have to realize, if I can explain this very quickly, by taking what we have out of TFL 24, we would reduce what the annual cut would be. So something has to be added back into TFL 24 in order to increase it. And to alleviate that a little bit, we talked about Lyle Island, or Louise Island. In other mm. words, you're saying that the, if, if they accept your recommendations to log Lyle Island with the exemptions of Windy Bay and Darwin Sound Leaf thing, the, all of the TFL material down in Burnaby Narrows and the balance of TFL 24 would be removed from the TFL altogether? Yes, once it becomes a park, that's correct. And you suggest that the logging companies could be perhaps satisfied by being given alternate land somewhere else? Yes, but that's something we spend a lot of time investigating, and I have to be honest and say there aren't many options available. The best option that we could see was to alleviate it to some extent by putting Louise Island uh, which is owned by Macmillan Bloedel, that is the TFL, and that represents 3% of TFL 39. We would want to put that in and then share the burden down the coast of what that costs, not make Macmillan Bloedel bear the whole burden. I see, but uh, this would have quite a serious effect on Western Forest Products and the three companies that get supplies from TFL 24 one way or another. It would have a serious effect on them, but we also say under the compensation heading that they deserve to be and must be properly compensated, either with wood of like kind or with money. Uh, cash or money. Yeah. Of course, the feds just don't know what they're talking about when they say they could give the provincial government 10 or 20 million dollars, do they? Well, it's very hard to know what that cost factor is going to be, and, and of course there was no way we could, you can imagine how complex that is, there's no way we could investigate that and get to, a bot to the bottom of it within the four months we had. Next question. This came about because of the fact that the provincial government issued the cutting permits and the hiders stepped, what you might say, into the breach. 
do you tackle the Indian land claims, the Haida claims as such in this report? Not the Haida claims. We make it very clear that that's outside our mandate completely. They've got a political solution or a judicial solution to seek, and they're doing it. We simply say that apart from the Aboriginal title claims, there is an existing use and there are existing values that the native people have. And we try to protect that to some extent by involving them in the management and involving them by consultation in the report. Now, do you say a, a federal, a national park or a provincial park? We say that there should be a national park because Ottawa has offered to do that and it is an area of world-class status let alone national class status, so it should be a national park. But if they can't make a, an arrangement, they can't cut a deal, so to speak, then we say the province should go it alone and make it into a provincial park. Uh, and was your committee unanimous on, on taking the, the south end off TFL 24? Barnaby Narrows et al. The committee was unanimous in the recommendation, but as to the actual, and they were unanimous on what should happen on Lyle Island. Where we had a majority minority <clears throat> was on how much of the rest of South Moresby should be preserved. And the minority would have preserved less than what the majority preserved. Right. This is the fastest growing reforestation area in the world, and uh, in, in Canada, I understand. It but may be in Canada. I don't think it is in the world. Uh, it's one of the fastest And you growing. obviously decided that part of TFL 24 had to go, despite the fact there's all this other land on the West Coast. That's right. Now, um, what about the Stein River Valley? Well, the Stein River Valley <clears throat> is an area that has really three components. There's the canyon itself, the Stein Canyon, about 22 kilometers long, which is not, which has no valuable timber in it. Then there's the area in between that I'll call the Mid Valley, and then there's the Upper Alpine area. <clears throat> we said of the Upper Alpine area, there's very little conflict in there, make it into a recreational reserve. We said the same thing with the River Canyon, and we said the central part, albeit a marginal operation, could be logged. And for those 400 jobs at, at, uh, at Boston Bar, uh, we were concerned and we said it could be logged, but not until they can make an arrangement with the native people as to where that road goes or whether or not a road goes up that canyon. That's the most logical access cost-wise. It's not the only access, but it's certainly the most logical one cost-wise. And once again, you don't tackle the question of existing Aboriginal rights, whatever they may be, do you? That's correct. But you do tackle existing Indian use of parts of the area. Yes. And you say you can't put a road in there until you've satisfied the demands of the Indians the other side from Boston Bar. That's right. What were your other major parts that you tackled to? <clears throat> well, I guess the most important thing that a lot of people haven't really talked much about is the process. We think that the government process that has brought about the situation we have today is inadequate, very inadequate. And so we've suggested a new one, a new statute with a nine-man board, nine-person board, <clears throat> which would be paid on a per diem basis, not a bunch of full-time people. They'd be brought in when needed. They'd have a permanent secretariat, and the decisions would be referred to them by government, and that's where they'd get the public input, in the same way, in some senses, as we have done. That's uh, now, uh, Nimkish Island. <clears throat> yes, we would, we would say that Nimkish Island should be an ecological reserve, and the forest company compensated for its loss. It's the tallest trees in Canada. Uh, give, me, give me a laugh on what Bill Reed said about bears on Lyle Island. <clears throat> well, when David Suzuki was testifying about uh, the island, there was a picture shown of a bear on Lyle Island. And the loggers there say there are no bears there. It's a question of, of uh, who knows or who's right. But they say there are no there bears are there. are no bears on Lyle Island. <laughs> one man, Terry Jacks, tells me there are, and he's seen one. That's since this. Anyway, Bill Reed took the stand to give his, uh, his uh, presentation. And he quietly sat there and looked up and said, I was there when Mr. Suzuki was filming, and I think I saw a bear that wasn't there. <laughs> you don't really suggest, however, that uh, the Moresby's, which is going to be any kind of mass tourist resort, because of the incredibly bad weather, 90 days reasonable weather is the most you can hope for all the time, and the incredible expense, only people like John Turner can go run, run around the place on Darwin, the, the Darwin Sound, right? Well, it won't be Palm Springs, <clears throat> but certainly the tourist, if you look at the figures that were put before us, the tourism has grown in leaps and bounds. But I can't say that it will in the next two or three years be a tourist mecca. So it's not for a tourist mecca, it's for ecological preserve. Yes, and, and the fact that it is such a beautiful area into the future, if they were to log that first growth that's left there, Jack, of course it'll come back in 70 years or whatever period of time to a certain point, but not 800-year-old trees like we have in some areas like Bag Harbor and Windy Bay and so on. 
I'm going to take calls now. I've just got one, but I've got one good long section with Brian Williams on the Brian Williams Advisory Committee report. Now, after the break, and I'll take Pat Armstrong off the top. Here is, funnily enough, a call from Toronto. It's Pat Armstrong, the concerned citizens of the Charlottes, who's uh, bird-dogging the other group across the country. Now, Pat, you live and work in Sandsmith. What do you think of the report? Oh, well, I think that the recommendation that came down is, uh, from what we can gather out here, it's hard to get much news on it in the East because nobody's interested in it out here. But... Oh, they're only interested in it when they want to put a full-page ad in the Globe and Mail costing $26,000 and stating a lot of inaccuracies. No, well, that's right. You can't find anybody out here that knows anything about the issue, and the news, uh, news media doesn't talk about it at all. But what we've been able to gather from a phone call back to Vancouver is that... Uh, with the recommendation that's been brought down, it looks to me like a recommendation made on the backs of the working people of uh, Moresby Island. There you are, Brian Williams. Is this recommendation made on the backs of the workers of South Moresby? Well, in the report, Pat, we, uh, we talk about compensation. We talk about the fact that Lyle Island, which has got, I think, 20 to 25 years of logging on it, uh, provided the TFL remained intact, uh, can stay. And we talk about compensating not only the forest companies, but the moral responsibility of looking after those people who are employed there. Now, I, I acknowledge that by taking what we have out of TFL 24, it could result in a reduction in jobs. Uh, there's no question about that possibility. But well, I'm glad that you can see that, Brian. I, you know, we certainly can see it. I mean, I can see with this piece of paper I've got in front of me that that's going to happen, and I know my community can see it and is going to feel the brunt of this. And I think that, uh, you know, making a, uh, it looks to me like what's happened here is uh, rather than, than just being concerned about protecting the old growth forest in places like uh, Bag Harbor and Windy Bay, where it would have been protected anyway, even under our proposal, those beautiful areas would have been saved. That what we've done is we've produced a. Uh, sort of a, a sailboat experience here, and it doesn't really relate to the people that uh, that live and work in the Moresby at all. Well, I can't say much more. The, the report is there, Pat. Except uh, that you did make the point that due to the reduction in the size of TFL 24, unless comparable pieces are put into TFL 24 elsewhere, the allowable cut will come down and jobs will be reduced at uh, Lyle Island and probably also at the Sewell camp as well. Yes, Sewell's got about 10 years logging left, I think Pat would agree with that. Uh, well, now, what, what, how are the people you're bird-dogging, how are they reacting to the, to the report? Oh, well, they're not happy with it either because, of course, they're, uh, they're a non-compromised group and they want it uh, all or nothing. They've never been willing to bend uh, at Okay, all. you're following them. Where's your next stop? Uh, well, we've got uh, today in Toronto, there's, uh, this is the, the stop for today, and then uh, uh, two or three days down the road, it'll be uh, Winnipeg. And you go to every meeting and you, you, put, you say you're two bits worth? Well, wherever we can get an opportunity to, we do. We're not uh, necessarily uh, welcome. We sort of, it's, uh, it's one meeting at a time. We take it one meeting at a time. We don't know how it'll go in Toronto okay, Pat, uh, this evening. Phone me from Toronto and phone me from Winnipeg. Much obliged. Go ahead to Brian Williams. Hello, yes. Uh, I'd like to put in my bid for the, the south-facing slopes, the one press side of, uh, of Lyle Island. Um, I was up there this summer and the whole area is just so gorgeous as I guess you've been there and, and you well know uh, uh, it just seems a shame to, to ruin it to, to ruin what? <laughs> the beautiful look, the beautiful area um, of which one? I've of seen one? both sides, I've been so in Pearl Rifle so Bay and I've been around the other side of Lyle Island and there's absolutely no comparison no of course there isn't, Stanley Park looks much nicer than any logging place up the Fraser Valley because the trees are still standing, you idiot <laughs> well, that's what I'd like it to stay that way. Okay. Can I just comment quickly on that, Jack? The south side of Lyle Island was certainly something that many members of the committee had a priority on uh, to your caller. Uh, we looked at the possibility of saving it because of the visual integrity, but number one, they're already logging over the top, as you probably know, and number two, to get to a high point of land, you'd have to take away five to seven or eight years of logging, and it simply wasn't uh, possible in doing the balance that we did. But Fair what? enough. And are the people who object to the noise of the whistle punks up there as auditory pollution? Well, we heard something to that effect. I didn't hear anybody actually say they believed that. But we heard people tell us that other people said that. The noises of whistles of men making a living is upsetting to ecologists and environmentalists. Well, that's, that's what someone told me someone said. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, good morning, gentlemen. 
As a former senior environmental bureaucrat and author of a book on the subject, I'd oh, like to ask the following. It's Charlie Keenan. That's right. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. Were well, you a witness at the committee, Charlie? Uh, no, but I made representation to the minister. Okay, ask the following question. Right. In that you and your committee carry absolutely no responsibility for the outcome of your recommendations, would you tell me what considerations did you give to the economic repercussions of your recommendations in that economics is the engine that drives our society? Thank you. Well, Mr. Keenan, I read your book as part of the work that we did, and uh, you are certainly very, uh, <clears throat> you have very strong opinions uh, against, the environmental, uh, against the environmental position. I realize that you put a great deal on economics, as do a number of other people. I can only say that we tried to draw a balance. Uh, we know there's going to be a cost involved, and it's a question of how you look at it. I guess it's a philosophical thing, and I realize where, you're, where you stand on it. But, you may but I think the whole province stands on the same position. Well, that's not the, uh, that's not the experience we had, Mr. Keenan, before the committee. We had 1,143 briefs, and far more of them were for preservation than they were yes, for... Yes, but uh, you know where those people come. The people that earn money the hard way aren't able to go to those committees. <clears throat> well, we certainly had the people from South Moresby uh, at our committee. We had hearings up there, Mr. Keenan, both in Sandspit and in Skidigat as well as Lytton and uh, other places. Well, from so, what I heard Frank Bevan say, you certainly didn't follow very closely some of their recommendations. No, well, uh, that's uh, Let me ask you a blind question. This Canadian Wilderness Federation, who's behind it? Any big names in the East? I don't know, Well, they're going to afford $26,000 for a, an ad in the Globe and Mail. They got lots of money. I just don't know who it is behind it. Because I'm told there's some real big money behind these people. Thank you very much, Charlie. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Frank Bevan phoned in earlier, and uh, all the way through uh, the, this whole thing, he's been uh, talking about workers and Much jobs. Uh, I don't see that that's Frank minutes. Bevan's uh, concern, really. Now, what you talk about is you talk about compensating McMillan Bloedel for with their money. Uh, you talk about the environmentalists getting what they want. Uh, the Indians still seem to lose here somehow. That is, uh, they get some logging anyway, and they don't get any compensation for what could well turn out to be Indian land. Uh, how the, it seems to me the only ones that are the real uh, losers out of here are the workers and the Indians still. And McMillan, Bloke, Dell, oh, et cetera, the Western Forest products will be the, the total winners. The environmentalists seem to come out okay. But what about the workers? Uh, have they been considered at all? In well, yes, of course. I, I, the workers were considered right from the outset. There were a number of people in our committee that made sure, for example, Roger Stanier is the president of the Duncan Local of the IWA. And he made sure the committee fully understood that. We took all those things into account. I guess the problem is the result we've come down with in a polarized situation like this is not going to appeal to uh, a lot of people. That's right. Have you any indication from the minister of uh, what he might do? No, none at all. He, he was, uh, I'll say this if I may about the minister, that I was very pleased that he published the report right off the bat. He didn't hold it back or anything like that. They put it out the same day. So he hasn't read it or hadn't read it at that point. Well, it's the start of a long, drawn-out uh, kerfuffle, as you well know, Brian Williams. But you and your committee did, apparently, a largely a unanimous job on all the major issues. Yes. My thanks to Brian Williams. Back to the law practice for you, eh? Back to it. Uh, next, we're going to do the Peace and Citizen Hughes. Take it away. Howard Hughes was as mad as a hatter, the man with the long fingernails, the man who tried to buy every politician he could get his hand on, the man whom nobody knew whether he was alive or dead, up on the top of the Western Space Shore in Vancouver for some months, behaving like a crazy man. And there's a book about Citizen Hughes done by a, a reporter, an American reporter by the name of Michael Drosnan. Michael, he did live, did he not? Oh, yes. Uh, Howard Hughes definitely did exist. And he did die. And he did die. In fact, he was the only man who had to die to prove he'd been alive. Did anybody ever see the body after he died? And as a matter of fact, the IRS swooped down and took the fingerprints from the cops to make sure he was uh, Howard Hughes. And <laughs> is it correct, said he, like a prosecuting counsel, that he donated his body to medical science and they wouldn't take it? Not true. <laughs> <laughs> Not true. Let's start somewhere near the beginning. Hughes had been a brilliantly normal man who made his name in the aircraft industry, am I correct? 
He was a newsreel hero, um, a man known for making movies, for flying airplanes, breaking all the world records, a very brave man who was test pilot for airplanes he designed and built, uh, who crashed three times and went back up again. Kind of a folklore hero in America, certainly, in his early days, lived the American dream. A man who got a check for $546 million, the biggest personal check ever issued in the United States. The biggest check ever to go to one man at one time in all of history anywhere in the world, I believe. And a man who had his choice and used the most beautiful women he could buy. Uh, that's also true. Uh, created sex symbols, Gene Harlow, Jane Russell, and uh, was seen with all the screen goddesses. And when did he go crazy? Well, in the late 1950s, there were a series of crises in his life about to lose control of his most beloved business enterprise, his airline, TWA, at the peak of that crisis, his right-hand man, the man who had run his business empire for him for 30 years, his surrogate father, really, suddenly quit. On top of that, Hughes was forced to get married to a young actress named Jean Peters. She said she would leave him if they didn't get married. But Hughes couldn't share his life, couldn't stand the intimacy, so he retreated instead to a bungalow, Beverly Hills Hotel, stripped off his clothes, and began his descent into total seclusion and madness. And he kept her in a separate establishment not very far away and she wasn't allowed to visit. Exactly, he didn't see his new wife for three years. Now, had he just done that, you know, created a vast personal empire and behaved like an eccentric, he wouldn't really have mattered, would he? Uh, he wouldn't really have mattered uh, if he didn't have the largest fortune in the world. But since he did have the largest fortune in the world and the will to use it, to influence national politics in America, then he mattered quite a bit. Now, there was a phony who wrote a book about, about Howard Hughes. That was Clifford Irving, was it not? Uh, it certainly was, and uh, that man gave me endless trouble because when I came up with the real Howard Hughes papers, of course, I had to overcome the Clifford Irving factor. You've overrun your cue just a little bit. I want to know, how can you tell me that this book, this Citizen Hughes, top of the New York Times bestseller list as a pocketbook is the real book about the real Hughes. Where's your proof? Okay, obviously that was the first question we had when I got the documents. Uh, we, uh, what documents? 10,000 internal documents of the Hughes empire, including virtually everything that Howard Hughes ever put down in writing. Uh, the first thing we did is we brought in the two leading handwriting experts in the country, indeed in the world, the man who had debunked Clifford Irving, the man who had shown that that phony Mormon will was a forgery. Um, in addition to that, and both of them backed these documents 100%. In addition to that, right after my book was first published in hardcover, uh, one of the only five human beings who had daily face-to-face -face contact with Howard Hughes, one of his Mormon aides, also said the documents were real. And the man who received most of the memos Howard Hughes wrote, his right-hand man, Robert Mayhew, also says they're genuine. No one has challenged the authenticity of these documents. Now you must give me a story of uh, where the documents were and how they got into your hands. Are these stolen documents on which you based the book? Yes, they are, most definitely stolen. Uh, there was a break-in at Howard Hughes' headquarters back in 1974. All of his most secret papers disappeared. Uh, it was an incredible uh, event because every power center was suspect, from the CIA to the Mafia, even to the White House, because Howard Hughes had had dirty dealings with all of them. Uh, there was a massive investigation, FBI, CIA, a uh, million dollars was put aside to ransom back Hughes' dangerous secrets. But the break-in was never solved, the burglars were never caught, the papers were never found. Until? A couple of years later, I began my own investigation, ultimately tracked down one of the burglars, the man who actually ended up with the stolen papers, and was finally able to persuade him to turn these documents over to me. And do I gather that you ransomed them for a million dollars? Didn't have a million. I had $8.11 in my bank account, quite literally $8.11 at the time I got these documents. Um, no, what happened is that I gave this man a choice. Um, I had found him, the authorities had not. I told him I was going to write a book. It was either going to be a book about Howard Hughes or it was going to be a book about himself and his cohorts in the break-in. It was entirely up to him. But if it was going to be a book about Howard Hughes, then I was going to need his help. I'd need these stolen documents. And you got these stolen documents. These are the stolen, this, these are two tiny pages of the stolen mem memos and Howard Hughes' own handwriting in which he gives away all his secrets. Yes. Were they all written to this man who also never saw him, Robert May Mayhew? Most of them were. Um, 
Robert Mayhew uh, worked for Howard Hughes for 16 years, never once met him face to face, although for the last four of those years he ran Hughes' empire for him. And the way Hughes commanded his empire was by these handwritten memos, by correspondence, because Hughes never even spoke to his other top executives. Before we come to the, politically, the political evil of this man, and he was evil, wasn't he? Uh, evil in the impact he had, perhaps not evil in one sense because he was unaware. Just put me off by telling me some of his personal habits and how he lived, apart from summoning his aides by scraping his long fingernails along the side of his bed. Well, his um, personal habits were abominable. Beyond abominable, um, certainly. Picture the richest man in the world in a blacked out hotel room, buck naked, with his hair halfway down his back, his beard down to his belly button, his fingernails three, four inches long and grotesque yellowed corkscrews, uh, shooting up massive doses of codeine, a billionaire junkie, um, lying on a bed whose sheets were changed seasonally, I mean three or four times a year, in a room that was never once cleaned. Um, the richest man in the world, surrounded by filth and debris, unwashed, unbathed, uh, living like a derelict. What did he eat? Uh, he ate usually one meal a day, sometimes just a bowl of soup that had to be reheated several times. Sometimes he subsisted on desserts alone, but was so picky about the preparation of his food that he once dictated a three-page, single-space typewritten memorandum entitled Special Preparation of Canned Fruit. Nine precise steps that his aides would have to follow in opening up this can of fruit, just one of those steps involving using two separate brushes to scrub the can until the outer layer of tin was removed. And then? The fruit would be dished up to use, who lay naked on his bed, unwashed, unbathed, and never brushed his teeth in a room that was never cleaned. More with Michael Drosnan on the political influence and uh, whatnot of how to use after break. Howard Hughes has just alerted us. He has asked everyone to hold on. Tremendous horsepower kicking up. Howard is sitting directly in front of us. I'm holding on to his seat. Here we go. It's 55 for a throttle. It's 60. It bounces to 65. It's 70. It's 75. We were airborne for just a moment, and we were really up in the air. Howard, did you expect that? Certainly, I'd like to make a surprise. You were surprised or not? Oh, I said I thought I'd make a surprise. <laughs> Michael Drosnan, author of Citizen News. This particular memo was the start of a celebrated affair, and you explain it to me. It's a memo from Hughes to Robert Mayhew. Yes, uh, those two pieces of paper started Watergate. Uh, the story starts the night that Bobby Kennedy died. Howard Hughes had been awake for two days and two nights watching televised reports of the assassination. He waited until Bobby's death was announced and immediately scrolled that memo, which begins, I hate to be quick on the draw but I see here an opportunity that may not happen again in a lifetime. I don't aspire to be president, but I do want political strength. And Howard goes on to order that the entire Kennedy political machine be hired on to become the Howard Hughes political machine with the goal of placing his own man in the White House. And you know, it sounds like the worst kind of megalomaniac madness, and surely it was, but he succeeded. He managed to hire on the leader of the Kennedy team. O'Brien. Exactly. Bobby's campaign manager, Larry O'Brien. And O'Brien goes on to serve secretly as Howard Hughes' chief lobbyist in Washington and simultaneously, openly, as chairman of the Democratic Party. How does this lead to Watergate? Yeah. Because it becomes a matter of total terror to the president, Richard Nixon. Because Nixon has had his own dirty dealings with Howard Hughes. Nixon has received $100,000 in secret cash and bundles of $100 bills delivered to his closest friend, Bibi Rebozo. Not campaign money, but money for the president's personal use. And now Nixon is terrified that Larry O'Brien, leader of the Democrats, in the employ of Howard Hughes, is going to discover this dirty money and use it to bring Nixon down. So in the end, it's Richard Nixon's burglars who break into Larry O'Brien's office at the Watergate searching for how would use his secrets. And that, of course, led to the final destruction of President Nixon. Now, he had, had he, did he buy Kennedy's team? He got O'Brien and some of O'Brien's closest operatives. He did not get 
all of the Kennedy men. But it's remarkable the extent to which this naked madman could reach out from his bedroom while remaining in hiding and influence politics in America. Now, when it comes to influencing politics, was he at all successful? Let's talk about the atomic blast later. Did he ever achieve? Oh, he did. He got many regulatory changes to help himself, did he not? When news approached the government with routine business, he succeeded incredibly well. When I say routine business, he got from Nixon a waiver of antitrust laws so he could monopolize Las Vegas. He got from Nixon the president's personal intervention in an illegal airline takeover uh, achieved by stock fraud. He got from, um, well, uh, the Democratic Congress with the help of Larry O'Brien a special loophole in national tax legislation that saved a phony baloney medical foundation he'd set up as a tax oh, dodge. Oh yes, the medical foundation in which he fed hundreds of millions of dollars and paid not a nickel of taxes. Yeah, and it's really incredible. What he did is he took his weapons factory, a top ten defense contractor, turned it over to a medical charity and thereby made his weapons factory a tax-exempt charitable organization. He may have been mad, but he was still crafty and shrewd. Um, that's the interesting thing about him. Mad as a hatter, and yet really quite a brilliant man, something out of a genius on a certain level. Well, now, okay, so he, he bought some of t Bobby Kennedy's team. How much did he actually pay to Nixon under the table? Uh, well, over the course of Nixon's career, at over half a million dollars that either has come out publicly that I discovered um, to Nixon and his family, but there was more. There was clearly more because Howard referred to other contributions in his memos, but the amounts are unknown. But there was one man who, who stood up against him on the issue of atomic blasting underground in Vegas, and that was Johnson, wasn't it? Didn't really stand up to him, really was quite Johnson the opposite. Was Johnson on the payroll too? Uh, Lyndon Johnson had been on the used pad way back when he was a freshman senator at the beginning of his political career. Hughes had sent him $5,000 a year in cash every year, and it seems like a very small amount of money, but you have to remember that back then, a senator's salary was only $12,000, so it was pretty significant. Hughes looked at Johnson as a man he had once bought and was certain was still for sale. He wrote a memo in which he said, I have done this kind of business with him before, so he wears no awe-inspiring robe of virtue with me. He had a good command of the English language, Most too, definitely. A very not. colorful writer. And... Uh, he sent his henchmen down to the LBJ ranch to see the president and offer him a flat-out million-dollar bribe. Uh, but his henchman was frightened of making that blatant an offer to the president and, and never actually Mayhew, did it. Mayhew was told to do that, but he chickened out when he met Johnson. Exactly. I connect that. Exactly. Uh, and the, the object of the exercise was a million dollars to stop the underground atomic blasting in Las Vegas. Precisely. The key reason why Howard Hughes wanted to own the government of the United States was to stop nuclear bomb tests out in the Nevada desert. With the direct insight of a madman, Howard Hughes recognized the ultimate insanity of nuclear testing. By cosmic chance, he'd moved to Las Vegas just when the government began a major series of megaton nuclear blasts in Nevada. And Hughes, being a true paranoid, saw these bomb tests as being aimed directly at him, as if he was the target. He called it the bombing. And he was willing to do anything to stop it. Now, the mafia. Did he ever come head to face, head to head with the mafia? Well, in certainly Vegas? in Vegas he had to because the mob owned Las Vegas. There were rumors that Howard Hughes had either come to Las Vegas to join up with the mob or the alternate rumor that he'd come to Las Vegas to clean out the mob. Neither is true. It's just that he happened to come to Las Vegas because he liked the place. He'd been there before in his life. And there were, you know, in order to buy the hotels and casinos, he had to deal with mobsters. They were the ones who owned it. But he couldn't even get Dean Martin to do a show for him, as I recall. <laughs> he, Is that not right? He actually did get Dean in the really? end. Yes, he did. <sighs> This is your life, Michael Drosnan, isn't it, writing about uh, Howard Hughes? Did he ever have any of the Kennedys on the payroll? Uh, yes, even the Kennedys, I wouldn't say on the payroll, but when Bobby, for instance, was running for president before the assassination, he sent P.S. Salinger uh, to see Robert Mayhew and request a contribution from Howard Hughes. Well, that's fair enough, campaign contributions. Fair enough in a sense, except everyone knew that Howard Hughes did not have platonic relationships with politicians. 
Um, what Hughes wrote when he was informed of this, he said, Ari Kennedy, I want him for president like I want the mumps. But let's face it, it could happen. So let's cover our bets both ways. So he died lonely and friendless and none of these beautiful women around him. Who got the money? Uh, Howard Hughes never left a will. Uh, his fortune went largely to distant relatives he never met and probably did not even know existed. There's a nice irony also to where part of the fortune went. Remember that phony baloney medical foundation? Yes. Well, the Hughes Aircraft Company, that weapons factory he gave to the medical foundation, was recently sold just a few months ago to General Motors for $5 billion. And all of that money went to the medical foundation, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which has now become the leading source of funds for medical research in the world. So good can come out of evil. Happenstance entirely. <laughs> it's a brilliant book, Citizen Hughes, by a pretty sharp reporter by the name of Michael Drosnan. Do, do me a favor. Say the word N-E-W-Y-O-R-K. New York. Say it again. New York. New York, New York. We've got a new song. <laughs> I thank to Michael Drosnan. I'll be back after the break. Expo 86. Oh, well, Lyle Island uh, is only partially solved, you know. The government still has to act on the recommendations. And I don't think you've heard the vehement protests which you can still expect from either side. But maybe that's why it'll work, if it will work. So creation of jobs and allowable cut, as far as I'm concerned, and I'll never change my position on that, although I'll attempt to be reasonable and fair on a few occasions. But we'll talk to some of the other participants in this uh, very important issue as the weeks develop ahead. You can't do everybody at once. Tomorrow, Jack Jarreau of the HEU, Hospital Employees Union, and we're going to do a piece for the chiropractors in the fight to get recognition by the MDs at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs> Expo 86, 53 days to go. If you're a hospital employee, watch Jack Giraud tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.